just wanted to talk to you today, give you an overview of DYDX, kind of talk you through our platform and our product, and then talk through our plans for layer two as well. So DYDX is a decentralized exchange for perpetual contracts, margin trading, and spot trading. In general, DYDX is a decentralized exchange that targets more advanced types of financial products that you can trade on cryptocurrencies. I'll go over what perpetual contracts are, what margin trading is, and then why you might want to use these products. But in general, DYDX is kind of targeted at more professional traders of cryptocurrency and traders that want access to these more advanced types of financial products. So first of all, why would you trade on a decentralized exchange? And then second of all, and more importantly, why would you trade these more advanced financial products on a decentralized exchange in particular? This is probably pretty similar to why you might trade a lot of other types of products on a decentralized exchange. But in my opinion, especially trading collateralized products like derivatives and margin is especially important to do on a decentralized exchange for a couple of different reasons. The first of all, is that obviously trading on a decentralized exchange is non-custodial. This means that you remain in control of your funds for the entire time while you're trading. This is especially important for collateralized products like margin and derivative products where you have to keep your funds on the exchange for the entire time that you have a position open on these products. It's actually pretty different trading uh, these kind of collateralized products on decentralized exchange as compared to trading just more like spot or other types of products on a decentralized exchange. And the reason for that is when you're spot trading or you're just, you know, spot trading is just a fancy word for just regular buying and selling. Uh, you can use a centralized exchange for that. And then you can kind of deposit to the centralized exchange, make your trade and withdraw back to your user controlled wallet. You can't do that on derivative products because for the entire time you keep a position open on a derivative product, you have to keep your funds on the exchange or on the platform where you're trading that product. So for example, if you have a position open on BitMEX or Bitfinex or something like that, you've got to keep your funds on BitMEX or keep your funds on Bitfinex or any of the other centralized exchanges you may use for the entire time that you're trading that product. And obviously while you have your funds on that, that centralized exchange, you're really exposed to potential hacks of the exchange, uh, potential, you know, there's instability in the exchange if the you know, uh, team runs away with the money or things like that. And you're just not exposed to the same types of risks on a decentralized exchange. The second reason you might trade these products on a decentralized exchange is it's much more transparent. So the operation of the entire exchange is transparent and auditable on chain, obviously very similar to other decentralized exchanges that are out there. But again, this is really important, especially for more advanced types of products because it's not just trading that you're doing when you're trading these types of products. You're exposed to a lot of other different types of mechanisms, things like liquidations, uh, things like how the collateral is held, all of that. Um, and advanced products that you're trading, again, kind of similar to trading uh, or the non-custodial stuff I was just talking about is it's no longer a black box like you would have on a centralized exchange. And even if you can't read the open source smart contract code yourself, you can trust that there's a community of auditors of you know, more technically savvy people in the Ethereum community that are auditing a lot of these different protocols and are verifying everything that's going out there. And of course, DYDX has uh, you know, high quality third party audits and everything like that as well. And then the last reason you might trade these products on a decentralized exchange is much more open. So users trade directly on a smart contract, which is open to anyone. Again, this is just kind of the ethos of DeFi in general, just building an entirely new parallel financial system that's open to many different people all over the world that they can all kind of come and trade on this one place together. So now what are perpetual contracts? Um, this is something you may have heard before. They're a little bit complicated, but they're actually not super complicated. And I'll kind of go through what they are and how they work and why you might want to trade or users in general might want to trade perpetual contracts. So first of all, they're synthetic assets. Synthetic basically means that the assets that are actually traded, they don't need to exist in the system. Only one collateral asset is required for the entire system to work. So that basically means for perpetual contracts, there's only one asset in the entire system. For DYDX, it's USDC. The only asset our smart contracts know how to deal with uh, is USDC. But based off of this USDC through the derivative mechanisms of the contracts, you can kind of synthetically create all of these different assets you might want to trade. Um, the other reason you might want to trade using perpetual contracts as opposed to just trading the assets directly themselves is because of leverage. So contracts can be traded with very high leverage. 
what leverage is, is it just multiplies your gains and your losses, of course. So always keep that in mind when you're trading with leverage, it's certainly a riskier way to trade, but it can also be used to really improve capital efficiency. This basically just means you could come to DYDX or any other exchange that offers leverage with say $1,000 and you could immediately start trading as if you had $10,000 say. And then the last reason you might wanna trade with leverage is you can take long or short positions. Long just means you make money when the price goes up and short just means you make money when the price goes down. Um, so kind of getting back to the earlier point on synthetic assets, um, that's, this is really cool, for, especially for decentralized exchanges, because one of the things a lot of different decentralized exchanges really struggle with is trading cross-chain assets. Um, so you may have heard a lot of different talk about you know, various cross-chain solutions that are out there to say, bring Bitcoin to Ethereum or other coins to Ethereum or just other assets in general. They don't even necessarily have to be cryptocurrencies and to enable them to be traded on decentralized exchanges. Normally the path for trading uh, other types of non-Ethereum based assets on Ethereum decentralized exchanges is first of all, they have to be represented as an ERC-20 token or an asset on Ethereum. But this isn't the case for DYDX and this isn't the case for synthetic assets. Because it's synthetic and we don't actually need the asset within the system, any asset can be traded, you know, not just Ether ERC-20 tokens. Right now DYDX has our kind of our main perpetual contract is a Bitcoin perpetual contract um, but there's actually no Bitcoin anywhere in the system. So you can kind of trade uh, this asset that doesn't actually exist in the system. And this is great for decentralized exchanges. It just allows us to add many more assets much more quickly. The main kind of mechanism you need to understand if you're going to trade a perpetual contract is this mechanism called a funding rate. And this is really the core component of a perpetual contract. What a funding rate is, is it's kind of similar to an interest rate that you may pay if you're borrowing or lending an asset. But this is just a dynamic interest rate that is paid between those who are long the contract and those who are short the contract. I'll kind of talk through it, how it works. But it's basically like sometimes those who are long are paying those who are short, and sometimes those who are short are paying those who are long. So kind of for the entire construction of the contract, basically what we want to create is we want to create this contract synthetically that tracks the price of another asset. So let's say we want to create a perpetual contract for Bitcoin. How do we ensure that this perpetual contract that we create is going to trade similarly or close to the price of Bitcoin? The way we do it is with the funding rate. So let's say the price of the perpetual contract is trading too high relative to the actual price of Bitcoin. So say Bitcoin is like $10,000 and the perpetual contract is like $10,100. So what you wanna do is in this case, of course you wanna drive the price of the perpetual contract down to trade at the price of regular old Bitcoin. But how do you do that? So the price of an asset goes down when people sell or when there's kind of less demand to go long and more demand to go short. So in this instance, you would make those who are long the contract, uh, you know, those who are making money when the contract goes up, you would make them pay an interest rate or pay this funding rate to those who are short the contract. And this would incentivize more people to sell and would drive the price debt of the contract back down to $10,000 in our, in our example, or just the price of regular old Bitcoin. And it's dynamic because of course, the you know, price of the contract can change relative to the price of Bitcoin. Sometimes it may be too high, sometimes it may be too low. So sometimes, you know, longs are paying shorts and sometimes shorts are paying longs. But this is really just the core component and, and pretty much like the only main component aside from liquidations um, of the perpetual contract that you really need to understand if you're gonna trade it. And then kind of talking about the market for uh, crypto perpetual products, Perpetual products are by far the largest market in cryptocurrency. So they're bigger than the entire spot market combined. So bigger than every other exchange that's just trading regular old cryptocurrency out there um, is the entire perpetual market. This is really currently dominated by, you know, these are things like BitMEX, Binance, FTX, and a couple others, um, which are really big in this market. And then DYDX is a more recent entrant to the market as well. Um, and then the last thing to mention is that perpetuals are not available to US customers on DYDX. Um, however, spot and margin trading on DYDX are available to uh, US customers. You gotta read more about this online, but this is just due to a variety of regulations, especially around derivative products in the United States. So the next component to DYDX that is important to understand before we go forwards is DYDX is what's known as a hybrid decentralized exchange. Hybrid meaning that we have some decentralized components to the exchange and then some centralized components as well. The decentralized components are of course the open source smart contracts which are running on Ethereum 
Uh, this enables all of the great advantages I was talking about before in terms of non-custodial trading, uh, transparent and open uh, mechanisms for the exchange and everything like that. DYDX also has some centralized components to the exchange. So the central components that we host are the order book and then the matching engine. And I'll kind of go through uh, why we talk about this, or sorry, why we uh, offer these uh, order book and matching engine services in a centralized way. So the main reason we do it is because it's basically a trade-off for performance. So it allows us to offer much more performant trading on the exchange. So we can really approach or you know, even get better than the performance of a centralized exchange while remaining non-custodial and transparent. Specifically what I mean by performance, this is things like if you've heard of issues that uh, decentralized exchanges have with trade finality. Um, trade finality basically just means when you make a trade on a decentralized exchange, normally you don't know what happens. Say if you're trading on a Uniswap or a 0x or something like that, you don't know what happens or what price uh, you're getting until the transaction is actually mined to the smart contract. This is a pretty difficult user experience for a lot of different users, especially for more uh, performance and more professional traders who really need instant trading. They need to know exactly what price they're getting. Um, they need things like free and instant order cancellations on the order book. Um, and a lot of these things are just really hard, if not impossible to offer um, on a fully decentralized and fully open exchange. And then the last thing that it allows us to offer is a really simplified UI and then API as well. Actually, the API is really important. I'll go through that in just a second. But on the UI, again, with this kind of central order book and central matching engine, we can offer instant trade finality to our users. So this means when you make a trade on DYDX, you know what happened immediately. You know what price you got, um, you know what leverage you're about to enter into, all of these different things. Uh, you know that your order isn't going to revert or isn't going to cancel, uh, that kind of stuff. And then a lot of volume on exchanges actually comes from programmatic traders, um, as opposed to just users who are using the UI or, or the regular old website. But it's actually really important if you're building a decentralized exchange or any exchange for that matter, uh, to make sure you have a really good API and make sure you have a really good experience for programmatic traders. One thing we've heard a lot from different traders and especially more uh, kind of advanced or more fun based traders that are trying to enter into the decentralized exchange space is that it's really difficult to get started. Uh, it's, you know, it's, these types of traders are used to just trading on a centralized exchange. They're not used to say spinning up an Ethereum node or sending transactions to the blockchain, all of these different types of things. But again, with our hybrid approach, we can offer a really similar trading experience to what traders are used to on centralized exchanges, specifically programmatic traders are used to on centralized exchanges. Um, we have a you know, great Python and great TypeScript client and those just connect directly to our API. Okay, so going through a product demo now. Um, so let's stop, start here. So on DYDX, you can see it looks really similar to what you may have experienced on other exchanges before. And this is really intentional. Again, we're going after kind of the more performant, more professional types of traders who really want access to things like the order book over here on the left, you know, seeing different, you know, very advanced price charts, seeing very advanced statistics about their positions, which you can see on the center pane here. And then of course, access to a lot of different order types. So here on the exchange, you can see all those different things. You can see the order books updating in real time. Um, and then the next thing let's talk about is the different order types that are available on DYDX. So the first order type you can make on DYDX is a market order. All a market order is, is basically you just saying, I wanna buy say one Bitcoin and I'm willing to buy one Bitcoin at whatever the price of the market is at the time my order hits the matching engine. So it's kind of the simplest way to trade. A limit order is pretty much the same thing, but you get to specify the worst price that you're going to get as well. So you could say, I wanna buy one Bitcoin at no greater than $10,000. Um, and then if my order can't be executed, it'll just sit on the order book and I'll kind of wait for somebody uh, to sell me one Bitcoin at $10,000 if that ever happens. And then DYDX also offers stop orders. Stop orders are a little bit more advanced, but they're actually really critical to trading more advanced types of financial products. So we have two different types of stop orders. So standard stop orders, this is basically, you can just say, uh, I want to exit my position or I want to place a market sell order for one Bitcoin if the price falls below $12,000. These are really useful for positions if you're not trying to lose money or if you're trying to stop your loss. So say you enter into a long position on Bitcoin when it's $12,000 
And, you know, of course you think it's going to go up because you entered into a long position, but what if it goes down? Of course, you're going to lose money. How much money are you going to lose? Um, you could potentially lose quite a lot um, if you get to the rate, you know, the point where you get liquidated. But a stop order, you could basically say, okay, uh, I'm entering into this position at $12,000. But if the price goes down to $11,000, just sell my position and I'll cut my losses there. Trailing stops are a little bit cooler even because you can basically say, uh, you, trailing stops are basically you enter into a percent. So you could say, if the price of the contract ever falls by say 5%, uh, then cut my losses and I wanna get out. But trailing basically means that it will follow your position uh, up or down as it goes. Okay, so those are the different order types. Let's go ahead and actually place an order now. I'm gonna walk through that, what that looks like. Um, so there, again, on DYDX, the main concept you have to understand is leverage. Uh, right now, I already have a position that's 4.15X levered. Uh, we could place different order sizes. If I'm buying, my leverage is going to go up. If I'm selling, my leverage is going to go down. You can also use the leverage slider here on the left to basically drag it to whatever leverage you might wanna do. You could drag it to a long leverage, to a short leverage, just a really simple way to trade on the platform. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and just place a buy order here to increase the leverage of my position to 5.4X. So I'm gonna go ahead and place this order. Um, Actually, sorry, going back a little bit. So one thing to call out here is that the fees on DYDX are fairly high still. Um, and gonna go over this and kind of our plans for layer two in just a second, um, but we'll come back to that. Um, of course on DYDX, because of decentralized exchange, you have control over your trading on DYDX. This means you can sign orders directly on the exchange. What you're signing here um, is just, it's kind of similar to a zero X order if you're familiar with that. Uh, it's just things like what assets are you trading? What price are you trading them at? And you can sign this with any different cryptocurrency wallet you might use. And again, so just stopping it right here, right after we place the trade. So this is kind of the performance I was talking about before. You can see here at the top of the order book on the top right, my trade immediately went through, it was immediately matched, immediately finalized. Um, can already see the status of the order um, in terms of that it's been filled. Um, and then you can see the fill, you know, can see the exact price, can see the fee that you paid. Um, pending just means it hasn't been confirmed to the blockchain yet. Um, so we won't go through all of this, but you can kind of see with the, you know, remaining duration of the video, um, that's just the last thing to wait for is kind of the transaction to actually get mined to the blockchain. Um, one other thing to call out is when you're trading on DYDX, you are not actually sending transactions to the blockchain. It's kind of DYDX and the central matching engine, which is sending trades on your behalf. And it's kind of including in those trades, the uh, signed messages that you just made. But again, one of the limitations to DYDX right now is that, you know, you really have to wait for these transactions to get mined to the blockchain in order to see your entirely updated position. Okay, so let's keep moving. So a couple of limitations, we've touched on these already. So just first of all, trading fees are high. You know, this is just due to Ethereum gas fees. you have probably experienced this on any de different decentralized exchange. But of course, this is a really big damper to trading on the platform and to our users. Speed, the UIs feel slow due to needing to wait for Ethereum block confirmations. You know, would have had to wait for about 30 to 60 seconds for my transaction to get mined there. Uh, margining, this is a little bit more financially complicated, so I won't go too, too much into it. But DYDX supports what's called isolated margining. Isolated basically means when you're trading on DYDX, you have to put down collateral for one specific product at a time. So say I wanna trade both the Bitcoin perpetual and the Chainlink perpetual on DYDX. I'll have to collateralize my account two different times to trade both of those products. Um, and I can't just use one pool of collateral to collateralize all the different products I might wanna trade. And then the last thing is maximum leverage. So right now we offer 10X maximum leverage on perpetual contracts. And this is a lot lower than what you'd find on the centralized exchanges that in, you know, on perpetuals, this is where you'll see the hundred X's of the world. So our solution to this is a layer two integration and kind of our version one approach to that is we're doing an integration with Starkware. Starkware is one of the leaders for zero knowledge or specifically Stark based rollups onto Ethereum. Um, and I'll kind of talk about how our integration works with them in just a second. But first of all, let's talk about what are the advantages of doing this layer two integration with Starkware. So obviously, first of all, is fees. Gas fees will be about 100 times cheaper on the platform. The savings will be passed on to traders. And this will really just mean that our fees will be very in line with what you'll experience on other centralized exchanges that you may trade on. 
Second of all, speed. So the UI is going to update immediately on trades. Uh, funds will become immediately withdrawable. There will be no more waiting for transactions to mine, anything like that. So again, we'll be able to create a platform that from a UI perspective is every bit as good, if not even better than centralized exchanges that traders trade on. Third of all is margining, touched on this in the previous slide, but due to the increase in scalability, we'll be able to support what's called cross margining on perpetuals. All cross margining is, and it sounds a little bit complicated, but basically what it means is you just have one account on DYDX or one pool of collateral on DYDX. This will be used to margin any type of product you might want to trade on DYDX. So this vastly increases capital efficiency. So now if you want to trade, say, five different DYDX markets, you could use a lot smaller amount of capital to be able to do that. And this is especially important for market makers. So imagine you're a market maker on DYDX and you want to market make all the different products that DYDX offers. You'll have to, again, because DYDX only supports isolated margining right now, put down collateral for all, all the different markets you want to make on. Um, and this just means it's really capital prohibitive for market makers to make a ton of different markets because say DYDX offered 50 different markets, market makers would have to put down collateral 50 different times. Um, whereas with cross margining, they could just put down collateral one time and then just use that collateral to market make basically an unlimited number of markets. And this cross margining is basically what's going to allow us to launch many, many new markets in the near future. And I'll touch on that in a couple more slides. And then last of all, but not least, is uh, much more performant oracles leading to much higher maximum leverage. So what we're doing with the oracles is we're actually using the exact same oracle systems that we're using right now in, in Chainlink and then uh, the MakerDAO v2 oracle system. But we're going to, instead of putting those oracles on layer one Ethereum, we're going to put the oracle prices on layer two, uh, you know, the Starkware rollup. And this will decrease the oracle latency Latency meaning the you know time it takes from the price of the asset actually changing to the time that that price change is reflected on the chain. It'll decrease that latency by about 100x. And it's it's hard for me to overstate. It, you know, it sounds a little technical, but it's hard for me to overstate how important this is when you're op operating a leveraged exchange. And this will allow us to safely offer much higher maximum leverages. Okay. So let's go through how the Starkware integration actually works from a technical perspective. So the first thing that happens is kind of like we saw in our product demo just a couple minutes ago, you know, you're on the DYDX website or say you're trading programmatically through the DYDX API. The first thing that you do is the trader cryptographically signs an order that they want to make on the exchange. Again, an order is just a cryptographically signed message that contains fields like what are the assets that you want to trade and at which prices. And then the first thing that happens is that order gets routed to the DYDX matching engine. And this is just hosted you know, on our servers uh, in a central fashion. So if a match happens, match basically meaning say you're trying to buy Bitcoin and there's willing to sell Bitcoin at equal to or better than the price that you're willing to buy it for. So if there's a match, uh, then these signed orders together are used to create a trade. And all a trade is, is just a combination of signed orders. So it's a combination of all of the users that want to buy and then all of the users that want to sell. And of course, their prices have to cross. So what happens with this trade next is before we actually get to Ethereum, and of course, this is where all the scalability comes from, uh, DYDX sends the trade that we're about to execute to Starkware and to Starkware servers. And what Starkware is basically doing is it's queuing a bunch of these trades together. So you know, here's our trade five, and it's getting appended onto the list with all of the four previous trades that have gone before. And then periodically, Starkware will batch these trades together. Batching just means it puts a bunch of different trades in a group together. And then it will come up with a Stark proof for all of these different trades. And this is kind of the magic sauce that Starkware provides. Um, this is you know, where the zero knowledge proving comes in. Um, and it's basically just magical math um, that will translate this group of trades that we have into a Stark proof. And the really important thing about this Stark proof and where all of the scalability comes from is the Stark proof is constant sized. And you know, this, this sounds kind of magical. It's basically like you can pr prove a linear number of things or a linear scale of things. And you can translate that uh, into just a constant size proof. It doesn't matter how many trades are in the batch. There could be one, there could be a thousand, there could be a million. 
and the Stark proof would be the same size. And this is where all of the scalability comes from. So, and then periodically, you know, after uh, these trades have been batched together, Starkware has come up with the Stark proof for them. Then the proof is what's sent to Ethereum. Uh, and then what the smart contract knows how to do is the smart contract knows how to verify the proof on Ethereum. And then balances are immediately updated. We don't have to go too much into this right now, but another aspect of the scalability um, is that balances are no longer stored uh, directly in Ethereum smart contract state on chain. Um, because of course, you know, say we had a thousand different users trading in a batch and we had to update, you know, the storage slots on Solidity for all the different uh, accounts. Of course, that's going to start costing just a ton of gas. But how we're going to store balances going forwards is in a Merkle tree. Um, so uh, probably going into what a Merkle tree is outside of the scope of this presentation, but it's basically just means you can uh, effectively like prove uh, unlimited size of information in a constant size uh, string or just data object. Um, so this Merkle proof is in kind of the root hash of this Merkle proof is the only thing that's being stored on chain and then off chain. Uh, we're also with Stark, we're using what's called a roll-up based approach, which basically means that for all of the account balances or, you know, uh, say we have this like Merkle root hash stored on chain, uh, how do we actually know like what the different balances are? Um, so uh, basically how we know that is we'll send the different balances and, and effectively whenever a balance is updated, we'll send what the new balance is, but only on the smart, uh, sorry, the like uh, information for the transaction that was sent. Uh, and it actually won't be stored in the state of the smart contract. It'll just go in the transaction data. So uh, I guess we have just have a couple minutes left, but touching on why do we go with Starkware as opposed to a number of different alternatives that are out there? Um, first of all, I think there are a lot of great alternatives for scalability there that are out there. Um, there are a lot of different alternatives that you know have different trade-offs, um, but specifically for us with our hybrid approach, we felt like Starkware was the best solution right now, but we are open uh, in a really big way to exploring other scalability solutions in the future. So the first is instant batch finality. Uh, so compared with optimistic rollups, if you're at all familiar with that, Stark rollups are immediately final once the batches are submitted on chain. So this means again, because you know, like we saw here, the smart contract knows how to verify the Stark proof. Um, it can immediately accept the balances as final because there's no way to fake it. Um, and this just means to, this just leads to much faster withdrawals on chain and much lower capital requirements for withdrawal providers. And it doesn't rely on fraud provers. So again, with optimistic rollups, one of the big things that, uh, you know, they rely on is fraud proofs. Um, basically an optimistic rollups, and that's kind of outside the scope of this, but just real high level how they work is a central um, authority uh, can basically put in whatever update to the state that they want. And then kind of they rely on just a decentralized network of fraud provers to be watching the state and make sure nobody is committing any fraud. That's not necessary here because again, the smart contracts uh, can immediately check the signatures on the proof. And then third and possibly most important is that Starkware is already live in production with Diversify right now. So we're pretty confident, uh, very confident that it's production ready. And right now we are not doing anything research-based with Starkware. Uh, we're currently building this from an engineering perspective. We've been building it for a couple months now, but we plan to have this live in production with Starkware in about two months. We're pretty excited for this because we think it's gonna be one of the most complicated uh, smart contract system that's going to be ported to layer two. Um, but again, uh, in, in our engineering team and our partnership with Starkware, we're excited to be able to launch this. And then last, um, and I'd say that this is important for now, but potentially not forever, but certainly important for now. It's an Ethereum based rollup. So this basically means that it rolls up to Ethereum, maximize, maximizing its decentralization and potentially even more important, just maximizing the access it has to the Ethereum based ecosystem. You know, things like wallets, things like testing infrastructure, all of that. So for the layer two launch, we're launching this in about three months. Um, actually it's two months now, I think this is a little bit outdated. So launching this in about two months, uh, planning to roll out a ton of new markets after this. So rolling out about 25 to 50 new markets in the year following launch, like we touched on before, a vastly improved UI and API um, alongside this launch. It, it's actually not just the layer two that we're building, we're building an entirely new product, an entirely new backend as well. 
So just really quickly touching on some future plans for DYDX or after we launch Starkware, uh, what are we gonna be focusing on? So first of all, a mobile product. Um, this is something that we're pretty excited about in probably the medium like six month-ish time horizon, but shipping a mobile app that's kind of a combination of an integrated wallet and a really high quality mobile trading product for cryptocurrency perpetuals. We haven't really seen anything like this exist in the market so far, um, but we're, you know, think we are in a really good position to be able to launch this. Second of all, is layer two margin and spot. So what we're doing with the Starkware integration is we're just launching perpetual contracts on layer two to start, um, but then we'll circle back to likely um, and then launch margin and spot on layer two. These last two are a little bit more future seeking, but I just post them as things that we think are really important and, and that are certainly we're certainly thinking about. Um, so this third point here, decentralizing the order book and matching engine. Um, so this is obviously a central point of failure for the product. You know, it exposes potential uh, censoring of users on DYDX. Uh, so we want to remove these components for the long term. Um, this is still a bit, bit of an open question as to how we're going to do this, um, but exploring a lot of different options that are out there. And then last, just uh, decentralizing the governance of DYDX. So exploring handing over admin control of the DYDX uh, to the community. This could potentially involve something like a token or just more you know, on-chain governance through some different mechanism. And that's it. Thanks so much for listening to my presentation on DYDX. If you'd like to learn more about the product or the protocol, uh, please head over to dydx.exchange. Uh, you can join our Discord group, uh, ask us any questions that you have, we're always happy to answer. But thanks so much.